Hey, Freedom Life Church family, we're so excited to have you join us here today. I'm gonna cover a couple of things on how you can stay engaged with us throughout this service. First thing I'd love for you to do is hit that sign up button and create a profile. And then immediately go into the chat room. We have hosts that are standing by, ready to love on you and help navigate you through the church online platform. Next thing is you can follow along with our Bible throughout the service. You can take notes and email them to yourselves. Follow us on social media. We have all the platforms. You can even share this service in real time with your friends and family on social media as well. If you download the app, you can always stay connected to Freedom Life Church no matter where you're at. So right now, without any further ado, let's see what God is doing today. Be online. We want to welcome you guys, whoever you are Yay. watching. Yes, we're so excited. But before we get started with why we came here with the worship and the word, we want to give you guys three announcements. The first one is, if you guys have a heart for missions, if you guys want to sign up to do, this is foreign missions. Every year we take two trips to the Dominican Republic. And this month is sign up month for that. We're so excited about that. So make sure if you want more information, get with me or Pastor Brianna. We would love to talk with you guys about the Dominican Republic. What's the second one? All right, next week after Sunday service, we have this thing called Freedom 101. Um, if you have never had a chance to listen to our pastor's heart, hear a little bit of our history, hear a little bit of why we do what we do and how, uh, how God has incredibly blessed us over the years. Um, if you want just more information about our church, the structure of it, different ministries. Um, we really encourage you to sign up to come to Freedom 101. Um, every single time I go, I've been blessed to be a part of this family for almost eight years now. Every single time I've been to Freedom 101, I either cry <laughs> or I just become so inspired because what the Lord is doing here is really, truly incredible. And we are so blessed to have the leadership that we have. Um, and so that's just a time for our leader our, and the rest of our staff uh, to get to share their hearts. Um, so if you're interested in signing up for Freedom 101, you can do so um, in the kiosks that are out in the lobby. Um, and that will be next week after Sunday service. Yeah, and our last one, I love talking about outreach. I started it, so we're going to end it. I can't remember the exact date, but I believe it's the first week in, in February. We get a chance to have an outreach expo where after the service, probably for about 30 minutes, we're going to have our partners there with Thrive, um, I believe the Azer Initiative, and a couple other ones that we get to partner with are going to be in the gym. And they're going to tell you guys their story to see if you guys want to get plugged in because we know that the kingdom of God is out there and we want to be a part of that. So we'll get the opportunity to do that. It's on Saturday night after service and Sunday after service. So who is excited about church? We get to continue talking about this is how we do it. And Kristen is going to pray us in. Father, we are so expectant of everything that you're going to do tonight. Father, we are so grateful that we get to come together and worship your name. So Father, I ask that you just prepare every heart tonight to receive all that you have for them. God, we raise up a hallelujah and a thank you, Jesus, because we are so grateful for everything that you have done and everything that you are going to do. So so with, with your mouth, I ask that you just begin to open it up and give the Lord worship. Father, we open our mouths and we give you worship. We open our mouths and we give you glory. We open our mouths and we say thank you. We say thank you, we say thank you because you are so good. You are so faithful, you are so patient, you are so kind. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Come on, begin to lift up the name of Jesus, the name in which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Father, we love you, we worship you, we honor you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good evening, family. This is the day that the Lord has made, so we will rejoice. Come on, can we rejoice together? Father, we thank you that you are a God who saves. You are our mighty warrior. So, Father, we celebrate you today. Come on.
open hearts declare his praise for who can stop the lord almighty say our god is alive the lion of judah he's roaring with power and he's fighting and fighting the battle and every knee and every knee will bow Set up and tell the heavens here a sight. Our God is the lion, say. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battle. And every knee will bow. Come on, raise that up. Our God is. Our God is the lion. Oh, 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 oh. For the sin of times to be in the presence of the Lord tonight. You're here on a Saturday night here for church. We had a powerful time of prayer and the spirit of the Lord is still in this place. We're just going to sit in his presence for a quick minute. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. I love we have these services. I can just feel it. Tonight's going to be a different night. So Lord, we just yield to you right now, God. We worship you. Hallelujah. I thank you, God. You are a supplier of every good gift to your children, Father. I thank you that, that tonight people have walked in here with needs and worries and desires, and people who are watching online just have worries and desires. And Father, you have you brought us here tonight so that we can receive what you have for us, God. So I pray with open hands and with open mouths and with open hearts, Father, that we receive right now in Jesus' name. Go ahead and ask him for what it is that you need right now. Just ask him for what it is that you need. Just pour your heart out. Come on. Jesus, we need more. We want more of you, Father. We need you to step into this situation. God, you are a supplier of good gifts. So we thank you for great gifts. Hallelujah. We 
thank you that you are our banner over us, God. That you, hallelujah, you do not grow weak or weary. You do not stumble or fall. But those who will trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. Hallelujah. That we will soar high on wings like eagles. That we will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not faint. Father, we thank you that tonight you're going to do something powerful in this place. Holy Spirit, we yield to you right now, God. We come here boldly, Father, asking before your throne of grace, God, to supply everything that we need. But Lord Jesus, we just want you to show up in our midst, God. We just want you to manifest your presence in our midst, Father. So I pray that anybody who feels far from you or close to you, God, anyone who's a little weirded out right now or those who are excited, God, that as a family, we can together say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, have your way. Not about any man, not about any team, not about anything, but all about you, Jesus. So God, right now we yield, we surrender, and we wait on you. Let's take 30 seconds just to wait on the Lord if we can. week to let the Lord speak to you. Let's take about 25 seconds just to listen for a minute. in our life, Father, that we do this, but right now we just, we just pause for a quick second. Say, Lord, have your way. Have your way. Move on our hearts, God. Move on our hearts, Jesus. You want to speak to us tonight. is about tonight, but I feel like the Lord wants to activate gifts. Just gifts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, we just yield to you right now, God, as we look in your word. Help us just to, uh, to receive all that you have for us tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Feel free to take your seat. Get yourself situated. The sweet presence of the Lord. Amen. I haven't experienced a Saturday night service like this in a long time. So I'm excited to see what God's going to do tonight. Uh, anybody else excited? Want, want the Lord to do something powerful, move? Y'all don't want to hear me preach. Y'all just like to get, get to the part where God starts moving. That's what we really want. I got you. Um, hey, so tonight uh, we're actually going to talk about something I think is really cool because we, we just experience this. And we do this all the time. It's quite often when you come to uh, um, church, and I don't think we ever really truly have a gathering, uh, a corporate gathering, without doing this. But tonight we're going to talk about the subject of worship. Somebody say worship. Worship. We're going to talk about this is how we do it and, and what does that mean. And basically we're looking at the basic habits of a believer. This is how we do it. This is how uh, the, the people of God, the children of God, this is how we exercise our faith and uh, we, we live in a relationship with the Lord. Last week we talked about prayer. This week we're going to dive into worship. So let's lighten the mode for a, a quick second. So I know what we want to get to. Let's just cut right to the chase. We always worship. We always sing songs, but it's 2020. Some of us don't really know exactly what to do during worship. And I got you. I told you. Y'all know. 
I got you. Here we go. Show that picture real quick. First picture. First slide. Can we get that up? There we go. All right. So if you don't know what to do during a worship song, I'm going to give you some hand gestures right now so you can get it. We're going to start at the very, very top. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. As a rookie, you got the elbow flap. You got the carry in the TV, and you got a big screen. You can go down to the intermediate, you're feeling a little saucy, okay? We got uh, uh, the, uh, my fish was this big. I'm holding the baby. You got the Mufasa. I love that one right there. Here's where we get to the good one. The pro status. I love this. I, this, this one right here to the far left. The, the dueling light bulbs. That's it. I refer to that as the church mother because I love when I see the mothers in the church who start praising God. They're like, yeah, and they got all the, all the bells and whistles on their wrist. They're like, come on. And they got the, the flap going right here too. Come on, God. Yes. Don't, I'm not trying to be, I'm just saying, you know, it's beautiful. The goal post and the heartburn, we got all the, I mean, look, the village beat the rocky, the touchdown. See, wherever you find yourself, that's what we got. All right, worship team, come back out. We're going to go ahead and practice this right now. No, I'm just kidding. But that's basically... What you need right there. That's all you need if you want to figure out how to worship. But I know some of y'all are like, oh, this is great. I finally got some new moves. But what does this really mean? Let's get to the serious stuff now. Okay, you can take that off the screen. So I gave you a, a little bit of choreography, if you will, so you can figure this whole thing out. Now let's jump into the text. So cultural expressions is normally what the church talks about when it comes to worship. Right? We talk about like the, the how, or is, is it, should it be a little more CCM style? Should it be a little more gospel style? Can we get a little mixture of it all? We get to this cultural idea and then we lightly touch on the Bible and what it says. But tonight, I want to take some time to comb through a biblical purpose and expressions of worship. Can we do that? We're going to dive in the word a little bit and then apply it to our lives. So uh, one of the books that I used I thought was really, really good, uh, this is a book that I actually had when I was in Bible college years ago. And so it's a book by Louis Giglio. It's called Wired, uh, Wired for a Life of Worship. It was really cool, and it has a 30-day worship devotion on the back. And this was uh, really just powerful for me because it helped me to understand worship at a deeper level, and I used some of the basics of it uh, for today. So here's my starting conversation. We all worship something. We all worship something. Whether you worship God or or anything, we have something that we worship. And maybe you don't consider yourself a worshiping kind of person. Normally when you think about worship, you think about somebody bowing, somebody surrendering themselves over. It could be demonic. It could be spiritual. It could be somebody who's just crazy maniac about something. They They are worshiping that thing. But here's the truth. We can't help it. We can't help but to worship because our our definition of worship is this. The starting point is this. Worship is our response to what we value most. It's our response to what we value most. What do you value most? In a moment or what do you value most just in your life? That's where we start from. And so how do we tell what we worship? We're going to jump right into this thing. How can I identify what it is that I worship? Well, follow the trails of your affections. Follow the trails of your time. Follow the trail of your energy. Follow the trail of the things you constantly think about and you, 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 your, your money and, and your loyalty. And it could be uh, work could be something that you worship. It could be a certain hobby that you have that you're always doing. You probably worship that. It could be some people that you just worship. You can't stop thinking about them. You're always there for them. It, it could be anything. So worship is more about what we do than what we say. A lot of times we think it's whatever I say to God, that's worship, and that's where I stop at. But we're going to burst that bubble here today. Uh, it's, it's a form of, uh, not just a form of verbal expression, but the volume of our actions speak louder than our words. And worship, watch this, is the activity of the human soul. It's the activity of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And I want us to set a good foundation here as we get ready to jump in to the deep end a little bit. Because here's the truth. You can see some of the most pure forms of worship outside of church. True. Go to any sports game. People go buck wild. They walk out on the court, football field, it's like, yeah! Like, you just get this excitement even when your team is losing, right? Here's the thing. I thought about this the other day. Pastor James, I got something for us. Here we go. You know how, like, sometimes people don't want to, like, shout back at you when you're preaching good? I got some. All y'all do this. Watch this. Everybody, if you have a child or have ever been to a child's basketball game, right, you're sitting in the stands. You're not a coach. You're sitting in the stands, and the kids are playing. What are you doing? Come on, Billy. You got it. Next time. Come on. That's a good shot. What are you doing? You shouting them down. Use it in church. There you go. All right. 
You shout them down. Hey, that's good. Go, good try, Billy. Good job. Don't stand up and be like, good try, Pastor Kyle. Like, sit down somewhere. Where are the ushers at? Get them out of here. I know. But you see it at sports games. You see it at concerts. I mean, people will just give their all in worship. They will go buck wild. We all do it. I do it. Everybody does it. But we don't think of it as worship because we don't really put a spiritual connotation to it. But it is the act of worship. So, so then here's the question. Why do we worship? If we worship, why? Where did it come from? What, what's, what's the whole point? Why do we crave something to worship? Why do we draw from idol to idol searching for something to adore? What's that all about? I'll answer to you. We are pre-wired to do that. That's just how we're made. I'll show you in, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 17, Paul writes this, uh, uh, this scripture. Show that on the screen. Can we get there real quick? Uh, I think I have that one. Where he writes it to them to, to help them understand really truly what it is and how they're designed. And I think they're having trouble back there. I'll, I'll, sh- I'll read it right here for you guys so we can have it. But he talks about just how all of creation, we are already pre-wired, pre-set to do this, even if we don't know it, even prior to knowing who Jesus is. So most of the time, what we'll end up doing is we'll think that only those people who know Jesus are actually the ones who understand what worship really is. That's not the case. Verse 15 says this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. That, that we were pre-wired that way. We are created in Christ. I mean, he, everything went through him, so therefore we have this draw. We are made by him and we're made for him. So... As we grow in relationship, we grow in understanding of really who God is. But it doesn't really answer the question about worship biblically. Let's start from where we first see the word worship in the Bible. Where does it show up? Genesis chapter 22, we read with Abraham and Isaac. I'm going to just summarize it for the sake of time. We read where God tells Abraham, he wakes him up. He says, take your son up to a high mountain and I want you to sacrifice your son there. I want you to kill him. And so Abraham is getting all these things together. He has to go and do this. And and he finally gets to the mountain. In verse 5, he tells his servants, he says, stay here with the donkey. Abraham told his servants, the boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. It's crazy because God tells him to go and sacrifice, but he still says we're going to come right back. Some theologians go back and forth and say, well, maybe Abraham knew that hey, God was just testing him and trying to see. But, or maybe he just had faith that God was going to resurrect his son. Whatever it is, God still told him to go do it. I don't know about you. When I read that, I'm like, how is that worship? It sounds like you're about to kill somebody. It don't seem like worship at all. How, how, I mean, where, do we, where do we get this from? And so I'm, I'm glad you asked. Abraham has been building a relationship with God for quite some time. And they've been going, you know, crazy moments. You can read Genesis 12 through 22. But there's been constant moments that God has also given him promises. God has got him out of things. He's wrestled with him back and forth trying to build this relationship with the guy basically that he's going to start all humanity with. That we are all descendants of Abraham. So he has to give him this ultimate test. To see if Abraham truly feared God, a.k.a. he wanted to know if Abraham understood who he was and therefore trust him. So still, the question is, how could God ask him to do that? Here we go. God wanted to see if Abraham would surrender what's most valuable to him. I want to know if you give me everything. Like, that's worship. Everything. We see in Genesis 22 that God that calls him to do this thing, and he's like, either he can be obedient or not. I can be obedient or I can just turn away from it. So we see the first part of worship starts with obedience. But then God says, uh, not only obedience, I need you to do something that you're not comfortable doing. Hello. He don't tell Abraham, I need you to lift your hands in a worship service. He says, no, I need you to take the promise that I gave you, your son, your present promise, and your legacy for after you die. I need you to take him. I need you to sacrifice him. So worship is this connection between obedience and sacrifice. We have this very, this very thing that connects the two that brings this purity of worship. But God wanted to see, would you be willing to give it, give it up? But why? Because God wants it all. 
That's how we really truly connect with the Lord. Is that when we give him everything. If you ever notice, maybe in your walk with the Lord, I know I have. Where there's been moments, even recently, God's been calling me back to a heart of worship. Because just in my role, a lot of times I'll keep one eye open and I'm, and I'm trying to see, Lord, what are you doing? Making sure, you know, i got to make sure that everybody's good to go, we're comfortable and all that kind of stuff. But then the Lord says, Kyle, I, I want you to stop worrying about what's around you and just really focus totally on me. Just give me, stop worrying about what they're saying and what they're doing. Just totally focus on me. Because the moment you do, when you, when you really have that connection and that deep worship with the Lord, I don't know about you, but I feel different. I feel charged up. I look at somebody and I'm like, man, I feel good today. I walked in here today and I've just been praying and I've been studying and I've been reading and I've just been in the word. And we walked in here and, and Pastor Randy, the online campus pastor, came up and he had pre-service prayer. As soon as he opened his mouth and read Isaiah 65, I was done. Because I've just been spending some time with God. And I'm not to, to boast, I'm just letting you know, like, this, it actually works. When you worship the Lord and you spend time in his presence, he begins to change some things. He fills you up. Boy, I'm telling you, you feel good when you're in his presence. So the moment we surrender all, watch this, Genesis 22, verses 10 through 13. I want to read what happens. Here we go. Thank you. It says, and Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy. The angel said, don't hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up, watch this, and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. The moment that we choose to worship, God will exchange, I'm telling you, we read this in the scripture, God will exchange our pain for his provision. What could cause us pain? The moment we worship, God, I don't know if I could do this. I don't know if I can fulfill what you're saying. He's like, no problem. I just ask you to take a step of faith. I must ask you just to worship. He then provides. He then comes through. He gives you what you need. It's, and for a lot of us, we don't want to take that step. I'm, uh, that step. I'm talking about myself here in this. We don't want to take that step until we can figure out what that step looks like. If I can figure out what it is, I got no problem with faith. Absolutely. Got to take a step of faith on that next step right there. Ain't no problem. It's a step. It's good right there. Yeah. But the Lord said, jump out. and want no steps there. We get a little uncomfortable. But God's calling us into a place now where we can truly understand that if, if we just begin to worship, we start seeing he takes our pain and gives us his provision. He wants to test us in these moments to see if we trust him. That's it. Just to see if we trust him because he's always going to come through. And so something Abraham knew that we soon discover is this, that God is worthy. Why do we worship? Because he's worthy. He's so worthy. And for some of us in here, we're like, well, I don't understand. How do you see he's worthy? Maybe because you're a pastor. And so, of course, you understand he's worthy. And so how does a common everyday person like me really grasp? I'm struggling Hard to see, you know, where God is at. Let me show you another passage where there was three guys hanging out with Jesus and just saw how worthy and powerful God was. And these were his three disciples. In Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9, we see the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus takes uh, uh, Peter, James, and John up on this mountain with him. He says, six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up on a high, high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, look how freaked out Peter is. Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Like people, Peter, shut up. Just be quiet for a quick minute. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified, fell face down on the ground. Makes sense. Verse 7, then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. What's next after that? And they, 
Oh, and then they looked up. Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. Last verse. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. How does this show that, that God is worthy? Let me show you. Because we see that through Jesus, he is the, the, the visible image of the invisible God, right? We read that. So we see here in this text that when he goes up on the mountain, it says this bright light shines from around him. Light in the Bible is synonymous with the presence of God. So we see in this moment the divinity of Jesus, just how powerful he is up on a mountain moment. Then we see something even more powerful. The moment Moses and Elijah show up, two great men of the scriptures, they show up. Jesus then in this moment receives a word from his father said, this is my son. Listen to him. In other words, God was putting his stamp on Jesus that he is more supreme than Moses. He's more supreme than Elijah. He is the all supreme one. Follow his word. Worship him. He's divine and he's supreme. But watch this. It doesn't stop there. Oh, no, we keep going. We start seeing that not only is he divine, not only is he supreme, we see how humble and how humane he is. Because Peter said, I can build some shelters for us and you could stay here. What was Peter saying? I recognize your glory. I recognize how good you are. Let me build you guys some houses because clearly you don't need to come back down off this mountain to hang out with us. You need to stay in the holies of holies. You are so good. You got to stay up here. But what did he do? He said, no, no, I want to go back down with you guys. See, that's why he's worthy. It's because he did not choose, watch this, to stay on a mountain. God has always been coming from heaven and from the mountaintop down to his children. I'm telling you, we see in the Mount of Transfiguration, and we see it at the cross at Calvary. He didn't stay on the cross. What happened? He came down. Come on, somebody. He's worthy. So that's why we worship. That's why, see, Abraham didn't have all this revelation, but we do. We see how powerful God is in the moment. We see how worthy he is. See, God, God did what he asked Abraham to do. He sacrificed his son. The only thing that Abraham didn't have to do was actually go through with it because God just wanted to test. But God went through with it. In other words, he exchanged our pain for his provision, but he said, I'm going to take your pain and I'm going to actually go through your pain. That's why we worship him, because he understands what we go through. For some of us, we're like, I can't take no more. I can't go past where I'm at. Remember, God went past your pain and felt even more. He took every lash. He took every beating. He took every ridicule. He died so that we could have life, so that we could worship. I live to worship him. I live to give him glory. Because of what I see, I'm beginning to understand more and more just how worthy he is. So the cross was not just this amazing act. The cross was a response from God to us. He was responding to us. A helpless people who don't know what to do. He said, I'm going I'm, I'm to respond to you with, with a sign that is just undeniable, a sign that you could never forget. My son on that cross, we think that's morbid, that's crazy, but he's like, I have to shock you so that you can understand. i got to make it sit with you all the days of your life so that you will never forget that my love is always there. So when the moment we start to understand who God is, the moment we realize just how powerful he is, worship becomes a posture of the heart. That's why we, it becomes a posture of our heart. I just see how worthy you are. It's in my heart now. I understand. I love when I see people worship and it comes from a deep place in their heart because I look at them and I say, man, I don't know what they've been through, but clearly they need some time with God right now because it's, it's coming from a place of the heart. So we know why we worship. So let's get to the more specifics of it all. So, so what, what really is worship or, or, or what do we do or what does it look like? We'll start taking that trail. So there's a, a man by the name of Brother Lawrence. He was a monk um, in the 1600s. There's a book that's written about him called The Practice of the Presence of God. And uh, I, I read a, a, an excerpt of that book. Uh, actually, it was a modern-day translation called God is Here. And it talked about how he was a Frenchman and after the army, went and became a monk, and he really gained a reputation of practicing God's presence, really worshiping in the common business of life, is what he said, the common business, the everyday business. 
So no matter how mundane or routine the task was, his thought was this, is that it, whatever it is, is a medium of God's love. That the issue was not how sacred or how powerful the act was the, or how much worldly status it was. He was no matter what you do, you can worship God based on the motivation behind what you do. That whatever you do, you can worship him. And so one of the quotes, while he was assigned to the kitchen, watch this. He said, one of these quotes says, nor is it the, the needful uh, uh, that we should have great things to do. We can do little things for God. I turn the cake that, that is in the frying, uh, uh, frying on the pan for the love of him. And that done, if there is nothing else to call me, I prostrate myself in worship before him who has given me grace to work. Afterwards, I rise happier than a king. It is enough for me to pick up but a straw from the ground for the love of God. In other words, he's saying worship, worship is something that we can do all the time. That in everything we do, we do it as unto the Lord. In the basic needs, so whether you have a job or you're a stay-at-home mom or you're a student and you're studying for an exam or a test or you, you have work, issue, and whatever it is, anything you do can be done unto the Lord. And that could sound strange. Because we're so used to worship just being something sacred that we have in a moment. But worship is so much more than just moments. The motivation behind what we do expresses our worship. So worship has to begin in the heart. But watch this. It's ultimately meant to be a lifestyle. It's meant to be how we live. And we can see even in the book of Acts chapter 42, or Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 47, we see how the believers came together after the day of Pentecost. They came together and they were like just, I mean, if I got it, you got it. You know, I got food, you got food. You need a place to stay, you got it. Like we're helping each other out. What were they doing? They were expressing worship unto the Lord by taking care of one another. They were living this thing out. One of my favorite uh, passages of Scripture it's actually my, the favorite one, is Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's my favorite verse. And the Lord brought me back to it this year. And I want to read it in the message translation because it really drives this thing home. So, so here's what I want you to do. This is Paul writing, writing to them. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God has done for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. I love that. You'll be changed from the inside out, readily recognize what he wants from you, and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you. And develops well-formed maturity in you. And, and the only way that happens, though, is that if we choose to make worship an everyday aspect of our life. So what does that mean? When you're in the car, you can worship. When you're at work, you're at your desk, you can worship. When you're around a bunch of bad kids, guess what? Lord, just give me peace. I need right now. I worship you, Jesus. Come into this moment right now. I'm about to tear his head off, you know. <laughs> you can just begin to worship and express, right? Hello. Some of the school teachers are like, that is me, pastor. That is me. I need prayer today, right now, right now. Whatever it is that you, that you have gone, you can just invite the Lord into that moment. And I guarantee you, there, there's some moments where I, I've been able to do that, and I love it. Because you, you can tell when, when, when God has, has just graced you or blessed you, maybe moments, or maybe this is your everyday life, where, where you, you invite him into the room, and then things start to shift. It's not, about, not because of you. It's because you invited him in. And like, man, things begin to turn. Things begin to change. And, and you're waiting and you're like, this is awesome. So, so we want to make this an everyday thing. So here's the part we got to get to, though. We still deal with the semantics. We still have issues like, well, what does it look like? Where do you do it? John chapter 4, this conversation came up between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Jesus is at this well. He needs some water. He sees a Samaritan woman. Jews and Samaritans, they don't talk. Don't have no kind of relationship, especially not a Jewish man and a Samaritan woman. Oh, no, no, no. But we see this, this conversation, and, and so she realizes that Jesus is this, this prophet. He's somebody special. doesn't truly understand who he is. But she says in verse 19, sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? While we Samaritans claim that it is here at Mount uh, Gerizim, 
where our ancestors worship. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman. Like, watch this. I think Jesus is like, believe me, dear woman. The time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now. When true worshipers, watch this, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father, this is the best part, is looking for those who will worship him that way. That's the way he wants. I mean, that's the scripture right there. That's the one. Like, how does God want me to worship? In spirit and in truth. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So when you look at this, it's hard to process. In those days, if Jesus were to say something like that, it's hard to process. Like, there's not a mountain? Certain place? Like, there's tradition, right? There's things we need to follow. There's law. There's culture. There's comfort even. Like, we like this mountain. Y'all like this mountain. We got to figure this thing out. Jesus came to show us this, that we're focused on the wrong thing. When it comes to worship, we are focused on the absolute wrong thing. He said true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. Now, there's so many ways to break this down. I'll do my best to kind of, for the sake of time, look at this. Spirit, if you had to break it down to kind of a layman's terms, a way that we can understand it based on what we're talking about, it's the immaterial aspect of our existence. Things that we can't tangibly See, no, do, and I, the spirit man on the inside is the place where you have this, this God consciousness. It's the place where we receive fresh revelation from the Lord. That when you worship, you're receiving something from him. It's where your intuition is. It's where, 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 where your conscience maybe is as well. You, you have this inner being, this spirit on the inside. It's one of those things, I wrote it this way. It's an indescribable yet all-knowing aspect. When you can just like... You know, you ever been in a powerful worship service and you're like, man, I could just feel it in my spirit. People are like, I don't know what that means. Like, it's like, it's this relationship thing. We could break it down on the spiritual realms and all this kind of stuff. But, but sometimes you got to look at it. It's something on the inside. There's this spirit. There's this God kind. And I'll, I'll look at it this way. You have this God conscious core. You also have this, our soul could be more identified as our self-consciousness, our mind, will, and emotions. And you have our body, which would be the world consciousness. We're conscious about the things that are around us, what's going on, what's happening to us, or what we could be doing. So spirit, we understand that. We want to worship him that way. But we also want to worship him in truth, which is all that we see and all that we understand about God. So maybe you don't have everything figured out. You're like, I'll worship the Lord the moment I understand him. Got a lot of questions. And the moment he can break down all these answers for me, you got me, Pastor. It's like, well, good luck. Because he ain't going to hear no praise from your lips because you ain't going to never figure him out, you know. No, but, but the, the point is, whatever you know about him, praise him with that knowledge in mind. Whatever you understand about him right now, God, I don't know why I'm dealing with this, but I know you're good, so I'm going to praise you. God, I don't understand why this person is treating me like this, but hey, Lord, I trust you and I worship you. You are supreme. You are divine. You are humble. You are loving God. I love you. I worship you in spite of it all. So we just, we, 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 we posture ourselves in a way to be able to just worship him. And so we see in this story, though, something significant. I think it's something worthwhile talking about is that this is a moment she was face to face with Jesus. And that's what happens kind of when we, when we experience worship. We're in worship settings. We get a chance to be one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, one-on-one -on -one with God. And, and so she's in front of this well, doesn't realize she's actually in front of two wells. She's in front of a natural well where Jesus asked her to draw water. But she's also standing in front of this eternal well, Jesus, the cup that never runs dry. Something so much that she could have and they could hang on to. She didn't recognize who was standing right in front of her. I think that's the, woo, that's the thing that happens to us in worship. That we don't even recognize in some moments that when we're in a worship setting, we don't recognize what's going on around us. That God is actually moving in the place where we're like, I don't, I don't know. It isn't, I'm not comfortable. I don't know. I had a rough day. She could have had so much going on. But, 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 and, and here's the thing. She did have a lot going on. Jesus said, where's your husband? She said, I don't have a husband. He said, yeah, you're right. You had, you had five husbands, and the one you're with now is not even your husband. She's like, dang. 
you a prophet for real. How you know about my Tinder account? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but watch this. Oh, I love this. Pastor Bardo from San Antonio gave us this one right here. I love it. She, she was with five men. The one she's with now is six. But the moment she talked to the seventh man, his name was Jesus. I'm telling you. The moment she talked to the man, Jesus, what does seven represent? Completion. It tells me something. That the moment I get face to face with Jesus, hey, there's some completion that happens in my life. He begins to complete some things that are incomplete. I'm telling you. He's a cup that never runs dry. She found something in him. What happened after that? She ran back to the town where she was doing what she was doing and said, y'all got to come see a man that I just met that knows everything. And she brought all these people to him, and he went and hung out with them. What happened? A moment of worship, a moment of face-to-face -face with Jesus transcended that moment and impacted the whole village of people. I'm telling y'all, the moment we start worshiping the Lord, God starts equipping you to impact villages. God starts equipping you to impact people. God starts equipping you to impact your family. I'm telling you, worship is not just an expression. It's not a religious thing. It is a fueling system. I'm telling you. The cup that never runs dry. I'm, I'm. Worship, it's a posture of the heart. But then here, watch this. It becomes a position, the position of my life. It becomes the position, I position my life to worship you in season and out of season. When I'm feeling good and when I'm not. When I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm rocking it, when I feel like I'm failing. When I got fresh breath or bad breath. I'm telling you, I worship the Lord because it's the posture of my, of my life, the position of my life. I got to worship. I got to lay things down. And so I'll give you my third point right here, and we're going to wrap this thing up here pretty soon. It's a posture of the heart. It's the position of my life. And the third and final point here is this, is that it's a practice I enjoy. We should enjoy worship. I can tell you why. Because when you and I worship, this is so good, when you, when you and I worship, we are, we talked about this in our Revelation series. We are joining with the throne room of heaven. That there are angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, is, and then to come. The moment that we begin to worship, the moment we begin to pray, God sends angels to flight. There were some spiritual things going on that in the natural wouldn't make sense. You talk to your neighbor, but the moment you start to pray and you start to worship, God starts to do some things in the spirit that mess with things in the natural. And you're like, my God, how did this thing happen? And you can't explain it. I can't explain it. You're like, Pastor, tell me how this happened. Tell me how God did all these things. And I'm saying, I don't know. You just worship. That's what he does. He's, he's all-knowing. He's almighty. Like, that's, that's just how powerful God is worship is so much more. It's so much more. It's, it's something that we enjoy. So it's connected to something so much bigger. And I wanted to give us, I'm out of breath. I wanted to give us something to chew on because I think a lot of times because we're so used to worship in, in, our, in our church setting, uh, we kind of forget what we're connected to. We forget like this powerful aspect to it. Worship has been going on for centuries. Centuries people have been worshiping him. In, in, in the Hebrew text, there's a bunch of different words. I know this is kind of overwhelming, so I apologize. I just kind of want to throw it up there. And you can take a picture of it and study it later. But there's seven Hebrew words that express praise. And we look at these words, the halal is to, to be clear, to praise, to shine, to boast, to show, to rave. My God. This yada, to extend hand, to throw out the hand. This tad, uh, uh, toda, which comes from the same principle as yada. It's an extension of the hand in adoration. Shabak means to shout. That's one of my favorites. Shabak him. I love that. You got barak means to kneel down, to bless God. The zamar is like to pluck the strings of an instrument, to sing praise. And I'm going somewhere with this. Uh, uh, tequila, not tequila, tequila, right? It's derived from the word halal and means to sing of halal, to sing. And you can read all that. But, but here's what I'm saying. is that when we worship, we're connected to something so much bigger than just 2020 and our current circumstances. We are connected to something biblical and, and, and sacred and ancient that heaven is looking at us when we worship. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about how there's a, there's a great cloud of witnesses. 
and they're cheering us on so that when we worship it, there's not just uh, this normal action or just this excitement that's going on. There's something sacred that happens when we worship. And then if you're like, well, that sounds great, but what about some everyday things? I mean, you can use these words when you're, when you're worshiping, but let's go to the next one. There's nine expressions of worship I want to give you real quick. You got the spoken voice. You can be speaking and you worship. You can be shouting. You can be singing. Our posture, bowing, standing, dancing, all these things are ways that we can worship. Our hands, and now we're talking about more of a worship setting, more of a worship service. Our hands, we're playing instruments, we're clapping, we're lifting our hands. Nobody can say, I just can't worship. There's so many ways to be able to worship the Lord. And God is asking, he's, he's calling out for our worship. He's calling us to be able to have a moment with him to experience just how good he is. So it is, a, uh, it is a lifestyle, but it's also powerful moments, moments that we should participate in in worship services. But what we tend to do, and this is the last thing I'll focus on, what we tend to do is that we don't focus on worship. We, we tend to get focused on the distractions of worship around us. I'm going to talk about it. We see some people, when they worship, and we can get fixed on what others are doing and not worried about why we're here to worship. Some things are distractions. The Bible does talk about order and worship. If we're in the middle of a worship setting, somebody starts barking, they out of order. Okay? The spirit is subject to the prophet. So the moment that you are in a worship service or a setting, you know, the, the Bible talks about order and worship. We would probably call it situational awareness. If you want to Christianize it, it'd be atmosphere awareness, right? So if you're in a moment and you're just feeling the power of God, praise the Lord. But the spirit subject to the prophet, calm it down. If, if that's what's needed in the moment. But if there is a moment where you just sense there's a corporate setting and God is moving, then there's, just, there, there's order to how we do that. But we're not talking about disorder. I'm talking about a difference. We get distracted by the differences. So some of us didn't come up in certain settings. I, I didn't come up in church. When I got saved, I got saved in a Pentecostal church. Some people came up in more of, of a more reverent church, more reverent setting. I'm not going to go through all of them. I can't remember them right now, to be honest with you. I ain't going to lie to you. But we, we've come up in different ways. And so we've seen good examples and bad examples. And so that, that's okay. The, the, denominational backgrounds, whatever it is, different upbringings. You see people shout, dance, sing, cry. You're like, I don't understand, all that stuff. And so we get so focused on that. But here's the problem. The, the problem is not the differences of worship. The problem is this. we got to ask ourselves this question. Why does it bother you? Why does it bother you in a worship setting if somebody starts dancing? Why? Why does it bother you if somebody starts crying? Let them cry. Because sometimes you just need to pour out everything. Sometimes you got to dance. Sometimes you got to celebrate. And you ain't got to care about anything. That's why I love our church. Because somebody can bring a banner in this thing. Somebody can start dancing around. There's order to what we do. But when it calls time for worship, we're going to worship the Lord. And you don't have to let anything bother you. You let them do what they do and you do what you do. If I like to shuck and jive and shout, put that good music, I'm going to shout all I want to. If you like to sit there in reverence, we'll sit there then. But enjoy your worship. Amen, somebody. Get your worship on. Don't let nobody. I don't care what they say about you next time you worship. You look at them and say, you will leave me alone, big head. I'm going to keep on worshiping. And you do your thing. Worship the Lord with joy and with gladness. And, 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 and it's not about, because here's the thing. I'm not showing my value to them. I'm showing how much I value him. That's it. I value you. And why am I doing that here? Some of y'all are like, you get to save all that dancing when you're at home. I, when two or three are gathered together, there he is in the midst. So guess what? I'm going to dance. I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to sing. Y'all look at me and say, oh, you, you're dancing too much. Uh, let me tell you something. You read about David and his psalms and just how, how amazing he was. And, oh, David was a man after God's own heart. David danced butt naked before the ark. So you ain't said nothing about that, did you? I'm telling you, I'm using that as a funny example. But what I'm saying is that there's some things that we may not do, but other people may do. Don't let what they're doing stop you from doing what God is calling you to do. Worship the Lord. Worship him with gladness. They're giving God their all. So what do you have left to give? Give it. Give everything you have. I'm taking a lot of time. I'm going to keep going. So my worship 
tells a bigger story. Anytime I worship, it's time, when I see somebody worshiping, I'm like, they got a story. They got something to worship for. They, got, they have a reason that they're worshiping. They're, they're lifting a hand for some reason. They're dancing for some reason. They're singing for some reason. It's not just, and you may be like, oh, well, they just want attention. Who cares? Why does that bother you? Don't worry about that. Let them do what they do. Let God handle that. But you get your worship on. i got to spend time on that. I'm sorry. I just need to get all that out real quick, okay? Because God's calling us to a different place so that we can receive so much more from him. And the last question that we may say is this. In the middle of a worship setting, we can look at somebody and say, does it take all that? Matthew 26. Does it take all that? Matthew 26. Let me go in my mind real quick. Hold on. Matthew 26. I know you're going to see it on the screen, but I want to read it from here. Matthew 26, verses 6 through 10. Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who previously had leprosy. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, replied, watch this, why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? Why criticize or worry about why somebody is shouting and dancing? Why criticize and worry about why somebody worships the way they do? God is, is not concerned about the, what's going on and how they do what. He, he just wants our worship. It's not our job to be the worship police. It's our job to worship and to participate in his presence. And I think about that. That question, does it take that much? I almost think, let's turn that around and preach it real quick. I almost think that's what Satan says to Jesus when he looks at us. Satan looks at Jesus and says, does it really take all that? You're going to die for these little ungrateful people who are already in sin, don't want nothing to do with you. But you're going to die for them with the hope that they come to you. And Jesus is like, at Absolutely. It takes all of that. It takes every last bit, every last drop, every last moment. It takes exactly what I give. And we feel like in moments of worship that if I take a step of faith and I worship him, and I'm picking on a moment because we're here, we're at church, that's what we do. We can worship the Lord and receive from him, and we don't lose anything. We gain so much. You're like, well, I lose my dignity. No, David said, I'll, I'll dance even more undignified than this. We don't lose. We gain so much from him. So I want to encourage us here today. Worship is powerful. Stand to your feet with me real quick. Worship is amazing. We're talking about how worship is, a, is obedience. It's a sacrifice. When you understand how powerful God is and how worthy he is and how good he is, it's not just obedience. It's not just sacrifice. Worship is a gift. It's a gift that I get to worship my king, my God, that if it had not been for him, maybe, hey, maybe for you corporately or privately, radical or reverent, whatever worship looks like for you, only thing that really matters is that you respond to him. That's it. Just respond. Just respond. What better place to respond than around other brothers and sisters who love the Lord just like you, who don't have it all figured out, who don't have it all together, but they just need to experience him. They just need a touch of his garment. See, worship is my response to who the Lord is and what he has done. What he's done for me. My son Tobias is two years old, and I remember sitting, in, in, in the days that I'm off, we go in the living room, and I sit down, and I turn on the t uh, uh, TV, and we go to YouTube, and we look at these worship songs. And my son whew, started singing these songs. He's two years old, doesn't really speak a lot, but the moment he started singing about worship, and my worship, he's just kind of humming along. I looked over at him, and I never had this moment before until that. I looked over at him and said, man, that's exactly how God looks at me. The moment I worship him, he looks at me like, man, that's my son. Worshiping me. 
So I want us to take some time here tonight. I'm telling you, worship is powerful. That there's something so powerful that God wants to do. And I want to just put this out there. If there's something you came here tonight needing and you need God to show up, use the avenue of worship to be face-to-face -face with him. Use the avenue of worship. I want to open this altar up. I want to invite our prayer partners down. Use the avenue of worship to seek him, to lift him up, to praise him, to shabak him, to yada, to sing, to shout, to dance. Let the glory of God fill this place. Lift your hands if you would right now all over this room. Close your eyes, lift your hands. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are in this place right now, God. I thank you, Lord, that you love our worship that you care about us so much, Father. And I pray, God, that in this room, if we feel distant, if we feel dry, God, that we will fill up on you, Jesus. Hallelujah. That we will see the significance of worship. That when we worship, all of heaven is watching. That when we worship and bow in your presence, God, you are listening. You don't turn a deaf ear, Father. You hear what your sons and your daughters have to say. God, right now, in Jesus' name, I pray there's anybody in this room who is lacking something, who needs something from you, God, that they will rush to the altar, God, as a sign of dependence. That they will rush to you, Jesus, saying, I need from you you are the cup that never runs dry I will not leave here the same then I will get what I need from you Jesus so father as we worship as we worship let our worship resound in heaven let our worship fill this room right now God it's in Jesus name we pray you want prayer come down to the front let's worship the Lord come on my hallelujah belongs to you oh my hallelujah belongs Can we raise our hands and sing that together? To my hallelujah belongs to you. You're the only one that I worship. My hallelujah belongs to you. Come on, let's do it one more time. Raise your hands and lift your voice and sing it. Sing my hallelujah belongs to you. Come on, all over the room, let's set our affections on him tonight. Sing my hallelujah belongs Father, you are our heart's desire, the only thing that we worship. My hallelujah belongs to you. Mm, my hallelujah, my hallelujah belongs to Now from your heart, tell them why tonight. Sing, you deserve, oh, you deserve, yeah. you deserve. Think about it, sing, you deserve for everything that you've done, for all the ways that you've made for me, oh, you deserve, come on, let's do it together, sing, all of the glory, all of the glory belongs to you, come on, why don't you give it to him tonight, sing, all of the glory, all of the glory belongs to you. Father, it doesn't belong to anyone else but you, so we give it to you. All of the glory belongs to you. Sing all of the glory. All of the glory belongs to you. Come on, let's raise our hands and our voice tonight. Sing, you deserve. You deserve it. Come on, sing it to the Lord tonight. You deserve it. You deserve it. One voice saying, You deserve it. Come on, raise it, sing, You deserve it. For all of the things that you've done, for all of the ways you made, sing, You deserve it. Come on, to the top, sing, All of the glory, all of the glory belongs to you. Father, I don't give this glory to anybody else. Choosing all of the glory, all of the glory belongs to you. Father, I make space for you with my worship. All of the glory, all of the glory belongs, to belongs to you. Come on, sing. All of the glory, all of the glory belongs to you. Now, this time, raise your hands and open your mouth. Sing, you deserve. Sing, you deserve, you deserve it. You deserve, you deserve it. all of the praise, all of the you glory. 
tonight. Sing my hallelujah. Father, you deserve this worship. Sing my hallelujah. Nobody deserves this worship more than you, Father. my worship all of my worship receive my worship all of my worship come on you say here's my worship here's my worship all of my worship here's my worship all of my tonight.
feel like the atmosphere is really sensitive right now. We're getting ready to release in a second. But I feel like the Lord wants us to pray for supernatural healings. So if you need some healing in your body right now, we're just going to believe God and, and trust him. So I feel like the atmosphere is right. Come down to the altar right now. We're going to lay hands and we're going to pray for healing. I don't know why God chooses to do it that way, to lay hands on people and to heal. But we're going we're gonna to just do that right now. So if you need physical healing for anything, if it's a, a shoulder, an elbow, uh, a knee, you need physical healing, come out to the front right now. And we're going to pray for you. And when you come to the front, if you just raise your hand so we know who to pray for, and we're going to pray for some, some physical healings to happen. We're not going to be much longer, but we want to just take advantage of this atmosphere right now and believe God. Hallelujah. Get some of our leaders come down here. If you see somebody with, with an outstretched hand, just if you need prayer for healing, just raise your hand. Come down to the front. We're going to lay hands on you. You feel a hand uh, laid on you to pray for you, you can put your hands down. We're going to pray physical healing right now. It's sensitive. The Lord is moving. I'm telling you, this is the prime time to do it. We're going to have some of our leaders and some of our pastors come pray. Thank you, Jesus. Come on up. Yeah. Our worship team, y'all can go pray too. If you see somebody, if you want to pray, you can pray. Come on, we're going to just take some time while we're here for church. I don't want to be too long, but I want us to not rush a moment. We can see a supernatural healing of God happen tonight. Right now, hallelujah, Jesus, we thank you. Yes, Lord, we worship you. If you're not at the front, would you just continue to worship for a few more minutes? Let's take some time for the Lord to just worship. Let's just fill this room with worship. Let's let heaven hear our voice. Come on. We're drowning out the noise of the enemy, and we're just worshiping him. Come on. Yada, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. on the inside, all the broken pieces, Father, even emotionally, God. I thank you that you are healing people in this place. Those who are standing in the pews, those who are up here at the altar, 
those who are watching online, God, you are, you are making sense of the broken pieces. Father, we thank you that you are a mender, that you are a healer, that when we worship you, we acknowledge you, God. Hallelujah. That when we worship you, Lord, we invite you in to do what only you can do. Lord, I thank you that you are in this place now. Father, we thank you. We pray for physical healings to happen right now. That as we've laid hands and as we believe, God, that you're beginning just to change the doctor's reports. Hallelujah. That you're changing even. I just, I hear the Lord saying, I'm changing blood cells and I'm changing genes right now in Jesus' name. They said you would have cancer. They said you would have a disease. But the Lord says that I'm changing the report right now in Jesus' name. That I'm switching things around. That the next time you go to the doctor, Doctor, uh -huh. The next time you go, that the report shall be different. And God, we celebrate you already. We celebrate you already. We say yes to your will. We say yes to your report. We say yes to your way, God. We believe. We believe. We believe in the power of God. We believe in the weapon of worship. We believe in you, Lord God. We thank you for healing right now. Healing right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. worship this is unscripted this is nothing this is just us worshiping the Lord that's all it is making room for God hallelujah speaking to me and I was, wasn't sure to share it or not but then he spoke to someone else and the Lord said the exact same thing he says I'm breaking the backs of addiction tonight yep I just heard that and then you came and said that he's breaking addictions off right now breaking them off right now that's you. We don't even need to know. You come up, you want prayer if you want. We don't even need to know. But I just want you to receive that right now. God is, I'm breaking that thing off. And I feel like the Lord is saying that when we worship, we just got to lean into the spirit. We just got to lean into the thing that, that, that in the natural doesn't make sense. We lean in to the revelation. We lean into the relationship with him. The more we lean in, the more we encounter his presence. Father, I pray you break those addictions right now in Jesus' name break those drug addictions right now you, mm, hallelujah break the food addictions right now in Jesus name the sexual addictions God the relationship addictions father the financial addictions God the shopping addictions Lord you, mm, father I thank you that the addictions that people have towards other people that they can't take their mind off of them they can't take their mind off of what hurt mm, wow the addiction of being broken I thank you that that is being broken right now in Jesus name that you are not broken, that you are being made new, that you are being made new, says the Lord. So, Father, we just yield. Hallelujah. We just yield. We yield. We worship you. 
one final time. Can we just, just open your hands right where you are? God, pour out your spirit upon all flesh. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh, God. A fresh feeling. Fresh feeling, Jesus. You are so good, God. That when we truly worship you in spirit and in truth, God, that we receive from you, Lord. I pray every spirit be open right now in Jesus' name. I pray that every truth be expanded right now in Jesus' name. God, that as we worship you, Lord, that the truth of how we know you now will change instantly because we have a closer relationship with you, that we have an encounter with you that expands our truth, God. Let our truth expand now in Jesus' name. We know you greater when we worship you more. Father, I thank you that we are people created to worship you created to worship you in spirit and in truth, young and old, those close to you and far away. Father, you hear every cry, God, and you respond prior to our cry, Father. We thank you, Lord, that we are created to worship you. So I thank you that worship, as we have it here, we don't leave it here, we take it with us. The rest of this week, we will worship you in the mundane. We will worship you in the ordinary. We will worship you and experience you. God, I pray that there's moments that we got to pull over and just cry because your presence is so strong. I pray that there's moments that we go to work that you give us words for people because we spent time with you on the drive there. God, I pray that we pray for people and we experience your presence like never before. God, help us to turn off the TV and the Netflix and the social media just to spend time with you and worship and receive all all that we need from you, God. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, Freedom Life Church family, I'm excited to share something with you today. Over the past few years, God has done some incredible things here at Freedom Life Church. And one of the reasons is your giving. You have given of your time, you have given in prayer, and you have contributed financially. Well, we wanted to enhance that and make it even easier for you. So we've established a text to give feature. And it's as simple as that. On your phone, you text this number, 1-855-440-4064 and the amount you desire to give and send. It's as easy as that. Now there are a few locations that you can give to. If you simply give an amount to that number, it'll go to our general fund. But if you want to give of your tithe, you would type tithe and the amount you desire to give and send. We also have an expansion fund that if you want to give to that, just type expand and the number that you desire to give and send. We're really excited to see how this new feature can continue to enhance our partnership and to see what God does in furthering this ministry in the kingdom. So on behalf of Freedom Life Church, we thank you, we love you, and we're excited to see what God's going to do. God bless.